Aloha. If anybody can let me know that you can hear me in the chat, that would be fantastic. I haven't done a Zoom webinar for a while, so give me a second to get everything set back up. If you have any questions, please put them in the question and answer section. So as I go through, something pops up on your mind, just ask it in the question and answer section. Once I've finished, I will go through your questions one by one. So let's get going. All righty. So this is a masterclass on how to shoot, stitch together, and then upload an eye guide for drafting. So this will be specific to um, standard or premium eye guides. This won't. Well, the process mostly uh, is the same for a Radix, but uh, it will mostly be just like for standard and premium eye guides. So we're going to take through that. So let's start in settings. The first thing you want to do is, this is for new people, if you've just received your system, is make sure that auto align is set to on. Continue on. HDR, you'd want that basically set to external Rico for, um, for basic eye guides, for more complex stuff, you can change the HDR mode. Uh, that's something that we will probably cover in this one. This will be the, the basic work through. Um, you want the camera 360 volume, uh, the 360 camera volume here. I like it being at maximum so that when you're using, uh, that this is specific to the Planex. When you're using the Planex and you go and hide yourself around a corner, you can hear the theta make its six beeps. I call them trills. So it does a trill up and a trill down. Um, and then after that, you can go and pick up the system. Even if it says on your smart device processing, once you've heard those trills, you can go and pick up the system. So having this volume turned very high is great because you know that you've heard that and it's completed. You can go into the room, pick up the system and start heading towards your next location. So having that to a high camera volume is great. Uh, you can choose your, in, your units, centimeters or inches, whichever you prefer. Wi-Fi band, we do recommend five gigahertz. It has the best strength um, over a short distance. And as you're never really going that far away, this is the best, we, this is the best way to have it. So that it keeps that connection and everything's quicker. Uh, if you're in Europe, then you need to select your region. Um, five gigahertz has limited channels per, um, for, the, for Europe specifically. Um, and so you'd have to come down here and, and select which country you're in. Um, and this is automatically programmed to limit that as per country laws. Um, your access point name, you don't need to change this. Your Wi-Fi password, you can change these things if you wish, but if you forget your password, you're gonna have to do a full reset from underneath the camera. Um, so I would only change this if it's something you are guaranteed to remember. The power off timeout is how long you can leave the Planex until it automatically turns off. So this is, this is after 30 minutes, it will shut down. Now, if you know there's never a point where you wait for 30 minutes before switching off, you can probably change that to five or 10. It'll save a little bit of battery power in the long run. Um, or you can just manually shut it down yourself by pressing the button on the front or the power off button in here. Moving on to these next parts, we have eject USB drive. So that is basically as it sounds. When the system is on and you click this, you have to wait a couple of minutes. Well, a couple of minutes, I mean a couple of seconds, the USB drive will be ejected and then it'll be safe to remove. What's even safer is just powering off the system, wait until that's shut down and then removing it. A calibrate compass, you won't really need to do this. If you do find you need to do it, click on here and there's a little video and shows you what to do. It's very simple. Uh, same for the Align 360 camera. If you bought a core system, and you've added a theta that was your own, it might be a good idea to go through this. What this does is it aligns the lens center to the exact area you're looking at on the screen. So if I was to point at a corner here and take an image, what we want is that corner to line up with the corner on the data here. So if I point to this corner, does it hit the corner? Yes, it does. So this allows you to align that. It's just a, a rotation based thing. So that's pretty good to do um, if you've just added your theta to a core. Another thing to do is if you remove your theta and you use it individually on its own, then it's a good idea to align the 3C camera just to make sure everything's good. You only need to do this when removing or adding this, the theta back on. This doesn't need to be something that's done all the time. Format USB drive will format the USB drive 
quite simple. It will delete everything and format it as FAT32, I believe. Update system file is not required by you unless you bought a core um, and then you want to update that to a pro, which means you'd have to send the system in anyway. Um, you probably will never use this. Uh, most, one of the next important things on this page though is the update firmware button. We will, I don't know, relatively often, every three to four months release a firmware update, especially if we find a fix. And this is where you would do that. You just click on update firmware. The firmware can be found at goiguide.com forward slash downloads. You'll download that file, make sure that it has the, name, the same naming convention, move it to your USB drive, and upload it here with update firmware. And then you can reset everything here. Reset to factory settings. If you are contacting support, so on the support desk, with an issue to do with your system, it's very handy if you can provide us with all this information. So the system information here, the firmware version, the system serial number, the 360 camera model, the 360 camera firmware version, and your serial number again for this, sorry, the 360 serial number. Sometimes we don't need the theta information, but we do need to know what the firmware version is. So all this information is extremely handy when opening a portal ticket. Um, save system log, very convenient too. If you come across an error on the system and it's providing a, an error message and you're struggling to move past it, um, at that point, I would call us if you're on site um, or if you manage to get past the error, but still want to figure out what's going on with it, and get us to check it for you. If you save the system log when the error happens, that's going to be very useful for our team and our developers team to decipher what's going on with your system. And we can give you a few tips there. Uh, it could have been just like a lot of the time it tends to be a, a slight glitch with network connectivity. Um, so just making sure that you are connected to the right network can resolve many of the issues. I'm going to keep plowing through. Um, right now, I'm going to emulate a project. Now, this that you see on screen is a, we'll save the settings. Don't forget to save your settings as well once you change them. This is an emulator, so it can do some things. It cannot do others. So we're going to call this master class project. We're going to give an exterior wall thickness of eight. I'm going to click create. So this is your start point, main floor. The floor name will generally be the main floor. You can start wherever you like, but uh, for the purpose of taking you through this, I'll do that. Uh, main floor exterior wall thickness. You can change this here. If it's different, just click create. And it's gonna take us to the main floor. As you can see, there's no pano and there's the, only this laser data, which can be quite confusing at first. Let me just close some things down here. So this pano data here that you're seeing, this is a live view of what the system sees. So when you first put the camera down, you can confirm, oh, looks like the laser is working fine. There's no problems. This is what your system is seeing in a live view. You can turn this on if you like seeing it in the system settings too. Generally though, you don't need it on. And then we're gonna hit the capture button to process a scan. So once that scan's in process, as you can see, this is what the data has been collected. And you see there's lots of gaps, so you need to fill that out in an orderly manner. Now, line of sight is important when taking panos, so you must be able to see the last location you took a scan when you take your next scan. So this is going to follow through as we go through this simulation here. Stopping in doorways is very useful. It gives people a stopping point when they're actually viewing the eye guide. And if you do a nice flow of panorama images, or nice flow of scans, you give people a good path to go through as you are scanning. So this is about every two meters apart or so. Um, and as you can see, for a good example, this scan does not seem to have, li have aligned properly. As you can see over here, the line is offset, and the line here is offset. If you notice this on site, and then the system has not correctly placed your scan, Click the align button in the left hand corner and you are able to either manually, as you can see, I'm just grabbing this, you can manually drag it around like so and put it in place. So this is where it was, this is where it needs to be. So before and after, before and after, 
That's like an eye test, isn't it? Number one or number two? Um, within your actual system, you can click snap too. Snap does not work for me because this is an emulator. If you click snap, it'll try a number of different locations and most likely find it for you. So then click save and you can continue with your system. Sorry, with your, uh, with your process. You might have to click the top button here, the top right hand corner to go back to the split view. So this toggle at the top here just takes you through, oh, that's my full screen pano. That's my full screen scan data. And this is a split view. That's all that does. So let's go to the next shot. As you can see down here, we're gonna probably go into the kitchen area. Nope, we're doing an extra scan down there. And then into the kitchen doorway. So this person is taking a scan in every doorway, which is great because it gives people a line of sight and it gives people a path uh, to follow on the actual tour itself. The more the merrier when, you, when it comes to scans and you can always disable excess ones later on. The whole point is to gather as much data as possible, um, but at the same time, make it as smooth flowing as possible. We're gonna keep on going through this process and we'll see. In fact, we don't need to see the pano image. We can see the actual, the actual data building out itself. And you can see what you're looking for is to make sure that all the edges are filled in. So we're slowly filling in the ground floor, hitting every wall possible. And when we go into the living area here, the family room, I'll go in there in a second. You can see it slowly starting to fill this corner in from different views. There you go, it started to fill it out now. So your aim is to try and produce a flawless eye guide by covering every wall surface. And you can see that's what's happening now. So you can see as well, there's like this fill data with these all these different shapes and shades. This is showing you how much of the area is filled in. So as, you can, as we can see here, this is completely black. I know that this is because there's a fridge in the way and this data will never get captured. You can see the walls are completely black. And so this is a really good indicator to tell you, have I captured all the spaces? Look for any black data within this view here. Any, area, any areas that are black, you probably need to fill in, but there's a good chance this is a fridge, these are cupboards, this is the stairs, for example, uh, this is the understairs area. This is obviously a wall with a beam. You can see the walls here, so that's pretty straightforward, but anywhere there's a big like square that might be black, um, there might be a, a closet or a cupboard that you've missed, and you need to fill that in ideally, especially on the exterior. Within the exterior areas here, you can see that it's there's no data along this wall. It shoots off somewhere and then comes back in. So that's because there's a mirror here and the laser works with light. And so it's refra refracting that light from the other corner. So you're getting like a, a, a flipped version here. Don't worry about this. And don't worry about this window here. The drafting team is very used to dealing with these. So this has been compensated for. Uh, somebody mentioned to me recently that there is a, uh, another system that you have to mark windows and mirrors with. You don't have to do that. Um, our drafting team will see that it's a mirror and, and can assume that that's, that's good to go. So the final panel here is this last room. As you can see, there's not a lot of overlapping data, but it was just about enough. When I'm talking about areas without with black space, you can see this here, we zoom out. It's a big missing space here. So this is a closet. It was missed in this particular eye guide and that's why I like using it. It's because you're in luck in this scenario. And this one scenario where there's one pano on the other side, there's a good chance we can draft how deep that closet is at least. Ideally, we need that to be opened because you don't often get this. If this pano didn't exist, this would be a completely missing space this whole area. We would not be able to draft, draft this closet in because we don't know how deep it is. So that's just an FYI. Open closets, open shower curtains of bathtubs, um, 
you can always disable those panels afterwards. So do like your beauty shot with everything closed, then open up, open things up, open closets, open wardrobes, you know, so that we can get that data, how deep it goes. Very important on exterior walls. Okay, so once this is completed, you would go to, so this is the ground floor. Once this is completed, you would go to floor, add a new floor, first floor, click create, and then you would start on the second floor or the first floor or the basement or whichever you wanted to do next. This will lead you on, and it's the same process. Make sure you take panels down the hallways, make sure you take panels in, in doorways, just so that people have got a nice flowing um, like trail to go through. It just leads them through the house and they can see everything quite neatly. So once it's completed in survey, you will take this data and you will put it into, I'm just go back to the floor so you can see. You put it into Stitch. So to open a project from Stitch, you click the house in the top left-hand corner, which is open. So we're going to discard the changes here. And we're going to select, this is your project name. So one, two, three, whatever your name, your, whatever your address is that you've called the project or whatever project name you've called it. Dave's house, Phil's house for X filter. I don't know what you call it. Generally people use the address. That's a very much um, individualized identifier. So we select this, it'll load it in. And because I've aligned this previously, this is what it looks like. As you can see, there's a miss rotation. The rotation doesn't match here. That's something you can do yourself by selecting all of the panos. You can right click with your mouse button and rotate like this. So this is what it looked like. And then if I grab that with my right click after selecting all the panos, in this space, I can move it with my mouse, spin it around, and voila. I can left click and drag it. I can zoom in with my mouse wheel. Now, as you can see, this isn't quite straight. Now, that's not a worry for you guys. The drafting team will straighten it all out, but you can click this um, square up floor tool at the top. So that's going to perfect it right there. It did it so quickly, I didn't even see it happen. Um, so everything is squared up. Now, what you want to look for is there was this panel over here that was offset. And so imagine you didn't fix that on site and it was like this. You can see here that there's some strange readings right there, this green line. You can see that it's out of place. It doesn't quite look right. The jigsaw is not together fully. So with this being this close, you can press three on your keyboard or you can press the magnet at the top. And that is fine tuned selected scan. So we click that. It's going to pop it into place for you. If we go far away. You can see it's struggling to find a place for it to go with that mode. Number three. So what you want to do next is if it's too far away, press number two. Number two will scan all of the data and find a matching point for you. So number three does not work because it's not close enough. Number two has placed it. So no matter which angle it's on, if I press, so you can see it's upside down, it's, on a, it's not in the right place, it's not even on the right side of the house. Number two is gonna find its best fit. So I remove another piece here and put it right there. You can see that has not aligned. Number two, and it's found it. If we rotate it, press number three. Number three is never gonna find it because it's not in the right rotation. Number three doesn't check rotation. It just checks to snap to the closest. So number three, this should snap like that. Number two will find its correct location, rotation and everything. So that's number two. Number one is a different one altogether. So number one on the keyboard or the wizard like the little magic wand. And this one will completely tear apart your eye guide and put it back together piece by piece. So it's like starting a puzzle from fresh. So what we can see is we can, we can walk it through this and say, yes, that looks like the right location. 
you can see that the green and the blue lines are overlapping correctly. We can click yes to that one. We can click yes to this one. We can see that it's starting to build it out. It is the right location. It makes sense to be there. Yes. So it's like building a jigsaw here. Yes. We can keep clicking yes. So for this eye guide, I know it's at this point as a good chance because of the amount of overlapping data that it's going to complete it. So I'm going to click yes to all. And you can see that Stitch did this all by itself. Everything's in the correct location. Now, if it doesn't do this, it's a good chance that you didn't get enough overlapping data. Now, let me quickly just explain overlapping data again for you. So we have an eye guide. If we have this data here, we have a line of sight to that corner there. So that is overlapping data. So the data overlaps at a certain point, it'll snap. You just have to have this line of sight from one to the other. And it has to be over a reasonable distance. It can't be like 10 meters, 15 meters apart. The data is going to get too scattered then. But as long as you have something that has common data, you can see down here, even at this distance here, we have some overlapping data in the bottom corner. It looks the same. That's going to snap into place. Now, this isn't giving a great amount of information to the drafters. You're kind of getting just about what you need. That's not really ideal for a 3D tour, especially because you want people to be able to walk around and view the, per view the whole place in 360. Um, this also is very limited for the drafting team. They can probably draft most of things like this, but it's not ideal. It really isn't. I know there's some people that do one scan per room. Um, that can be done depending on the size of the room. Generally, bedrooms, you want to take two scans. I would say a minimum of two, unless it's like this bathroom. So let's just undo those. This bathroom here, you can tell that it's small, nice thick lines on the data for the laser data. That's plenty for this one small room. If we go to here, we can see that there's plenty in this room too. We don't really need this one, but it's really nice to have those two different angles and to just reinforce the data. Sorry, I pressed two there. So we're doubling down on the amount of data overlap. It just makes things a bit more solid and confirms things from different angles for the team. One scan in the middle of this room would probably do, but it doesn't mean that it's gonna be a great tour. You're gonna to have one view of a panorama coming in here and one going out. So your data from, from this room to another room, for example, Let's do this and then, which was another one that has line of sight, this one. So that one doesn't quite have line of sight. It sits around about there. So it's not quite good enough. It might snap. No. So you have to go through a wall to get to it. And it's just, it's a bit clunky. So introducing more scans allows your 3D tour to flow better, as well as giving you overlapping data and the um, drafting team more data to work through it. And considering each scan takes about, I don't know, 30 seconds or so, if that, and that's including walking from place to place, I would just get those extra ones. Okay, so once you've got it in Stitch, there's two things you must do, and that is check for overlapping scans and set an initial panel. So we have a right click here and click on set as initial panel. That tends to be the one people choose is the foyer. And then you can set the initial angle for this in here. So if we click the pie over here. This signifies choosing the angle of the panel. So you kind of want to introduce people and, you know, you don't want them to see the door immediately. So maybe a view like this, the stairs, or maybe you want to show them a little bit of that doorway. So when they open it, this is what they would see. Something like this. You don't have to do this with every scan, but you can do it if you wish. So you can go from scan to scan and set the initial angle, and I can't even speak, of where you want people to go. This can help to lead people in a direction 
or to show off a specific thing as soon as they get to the scan. You can do this if you wish and go through and set the initial angle, or you can do this later on in the portal. But because it's a 360 view, there's a good chance people are gonna spin around anyway and have a look. This just gives you the opportunity to do a little bit of customization. So as long as they are set, you can generally produce the eye guide and see what this does. So if I go to export now, So once it's created, so you may get an error message saying that um, to disable an overlapping pano. What that means is that you've got two panos enabled on top of each other. And can you guys still hear me? My computer just did something weird. Yep, it looks like the microphone is activating. Um, what it means is that you've got two scans enabled that overlap. We can't have scans that overlap within 50 centimeters because there's no way to differentiate them on the actual eye guide. So what you'd have to do is it'll highlight these, these overlapping scans. I can, I can um, emulate this error message, bear with me a second. So if I put a scan here overlapping, don't mind the data, put two scans on top of each other here and we hit export. See this highlighted scans are closer than 19.7 inches. Adjust position or disable all but one. So this link, We'll take you to a video on how to do this, on how to deal with it. But it's pretty straightforward. We click cancel. We can see that these two scans highlighted are overlapping and they are both enabled. So what we do is we simply disable one. Hit export, no error message. As you can see here, now that's in the wrong place. That was just to show you guys. That's all you need to do is simply disable one of the highlighted scans. Generally, this happens when you've opened closets in a bedroom and you've left the pan there, left the system in the same place. So if it's been left in the same place. Um, you've taken two scans in the same position, one with the closet open, one with the closets closed. Um, that's the scenario that you normally come into for that. So just to save the disable the closets open one. So once it's exported, you can click on create eye guide. What this is going to do is open the Planex data here. So this is the location where your Planex data exists. So I'm just gonna minimize this. And it will take you to the eye guide creation page. So it'll take you to creating an eye guide. So this will open up also. So what you can do is you can go through, I'm just going to change the size of this. You can go through, select your property industry. For this, we would select residential for homes, standard or premium. Premium have premium objects uh, detailed on the floor plan, such as washers, dryers, sinks, bathtubs, showers, toilets, etc. So we'll go for premium just because I like those extra features. Free add-ons, you can leave them paid, leave them on. Um, enter property address. So we're going to do. Um, we'll pick a random address for now because it's not staying in. We'll do that one. So you pick your address, you check. Oh, yep, that looks like it's correct. So select. Add your agent branding. If you wish, you can do this later as well. I'm going to throw my test banner on. Any of these test ones. Then in people, you go through and you tick who you want to have access to the eye guide. So here you've got your report subscribers. So eye guide manager, that's yourself. All eye guide editors, excluding the manager. So you know you can disable it if you don't want the managers to get it. All your editors notify the banner owner. So somebody else who owns a banner might um, might need notifying. I don't know why that would be used, but um, I can't think of a scenario myself right now. And then all emails from the agent's banner. So any email you enter in your agent branding banner here, you can subscribe anybody to that. That's what you typically do to send the report to your, to your client, the realtor. 
So you can add editors. You can add a primary contact. There's more details on that in our knowledge base. Analytics subscribers. Typically, you only need the banner owner and the manager. Some people don't like to get them. Some people do. That's at your, um, your own choice. And then you would upload the data. So because it was it opened the data for me here, I can take this, I can drag this up and drop on here. So that's ready for upload. This is also where you can upload gallery images all in one go. Now, if you don't have the data yet, which is um, what a lot of places do, is you have an admin team back at the office. They can create the eye guide without the data. And then your editor or your photographer can later on come in and upload it. So you can have everything set up so that when the photographer gets home, all they have to do is upload this um, to the eye guide later on. You don't need the data to create the eye guide placeholder. So then you upload your gallery images and you have advanced options here as well. So you can include a branded video and an unbranded video link. You can confirm the eye guide URL. So if, you, if this was, for example, um, a commercial property and you were doing um, Jenny's Cafe, I don't know why, but you could use that URL here after I guide and you can see that's available by the green tick. So you can customize the URL as long as it is a one-off. So the alias is one-off. Okay. The start options, I don't think you really need to worry about too much. Your measurement standard will be selected based upon, um, I think it bases it upon the area that you select your property address. So for example, if I was to select um, somewhere in North America, this might set it to ANSI instead of RECA, sorry, in the US. Whereas if I was in Alberta, it would definitely set it as RECA RMS. There's more details on that on the knowledge base articles too. You can set it as protected. This means that only people with an account on the iGuide portal and added to the list of viewers can see this. So it's some kind of, it's a level of protection. You don't particularly need to know about if you're new, um, but feel free to look on our knowledge base for further details. The most important ones here, um, I quite like this new one that we have, the zoom floor plan to walls. So what this will do is if you've taken exterior panos way away from the property, um, so you went down the garden and you took some panos um, and you went front, down the front driveway or at the side of the house. What this does is it ignores those panos and puts your eye guide in like the, the actual drafted data as big as possible. Now, sometimes you don't need, want to use this and sometimes you do. The only time you want to use this is if you've got a lot of panos a long distance away from the actual house itself that's being drafted because your, your drafted property is going to be small on screen. This will allow that to zoom in, but you're not going to see those panos on screen. You'd have to kind of navigate to them naturally through the 3D tour. Okay. So after all this, we would click create eye guide and upload. And then we have a completely different eye guide than this one to go through what it would look like on the portal. So once it's on the portal and it's been drafted by our team, which is next business day, next working day, um, we can go to edit view here, can go to edit here, let me show you that floats zoom floor plan to walls option. You, you can see that it's zoomed in as much as possible. Let's make this full screen now. It's zoomed in as much as possible to the walls. If I remove this, click save, you can see, oh, is it because I set it as well? Um, Right, there you go. 
So you can see it's not zooming into the walls. And you can see this panel and you can see this panel here. Setting it to zoom to the walls by ticking that button will animate and zoom in when you open the eye guide. It's just not doing it now because of hashing. I believe. So there's plenty you can do in the portal. You can change the title. So for that example I gave before, if it's commercial, you can change it, the title to Jenny's Cafe. And this is what is cached by Google. This title here is what's cached by Google search. So if you want it to be searchable when people go to Jenny's Cafe, this is where you change the name here. So you can put the name in and the address if you wish. And that's what's going to be cached by Google search. I think I've covered everything. So let's go to the question and answers. And I see a lot of you ask a few questions in the chat. If I, um, if I miss them, please put them in the question and answer, but there doesn't seem to be too many. So let's quickly get through them. Can we scan with people in a restaurant? So if there's people in the restaurant, um, it's a good idea to blur out their faces on the panoramas afterwards, but sure, as long as they're not moving too much, there could be people in there. It's just a matter of a privacy issue after that. Um, generally, we want to blur people's faces out if we haven't asked their consent, um, just as a general internet rule, right? So when, you, when you're using the drop-down HDR modes, it does take longer. The scenario I was talking about is when only the external Rico mode is chosen. So if you choose a different HDR type, it can take longer and you do have to wait to pick up the system. You have to wait for the processing to finish. That's because it's taking multiple images with the theta and blending them. So the, the, the trill that you hear is, doesn't quite signify that it's finished. So when you choose a different HDR mode than off or reco, you do have to wait until the processing is finished. Thank you for bringing that up. That's good to point out. Is this all in the app? So yes, this is all in the survey app. It's not technically an app that you would download on Google Play or the iOS store or the, the Apple store. Um, this is connected to via an IP address in your browser. So once you've turned the Planix on and you've connected to the Wi-Fi, you would type in an IP address to get to survey. It's all hosted on the system so that you never have to update your phone with the latest version of survey. It's all just, it's all on our system. Ryan asks, when we are using our branded logo, is there a way to adjust the size what is shown on the floor? I feel like the 1024 pixel seems too large in similar rooms, in smaller rooms. So what you can do is if I go to the eye guide here that I've got, I don't know if I've got a good example of this here. So I've got this silly Phoenix logo that I stole from somewhere. This isn't at 1024 by 1024, this is a PNG. And the circle itself is actually 900 by 900 pixels. Now I understand that cannot be changed. So what you can do with the Planix is as long as the Planix is perfectly level and stable, you can reduce this, you can do some practice and reduce to see how much of it you want to cover. If you find that you can get away with 850 by 850 on the circle, then great. The problem is the image itself, so the PNG you provide, has to be a square at 1024 by 1024. So what I would do is in Photoshop, or if you're using something similar, is reduce the circle size only and keep the main image canvas size at 1024 by 1024 with a transparent background and save as a PNG. I hope that makes sense. We cannot size it by room. So if we go into this laundry, it, it is, it, it's a little larger in here than it would be say in the living room, right? So you've got, it's just because of dimensions of space. It's not really any bigger. It just looks smaller because of, because the walls are further away. We can't adjust that automatically. You can't set like a, a pano size per room. But what you can do is reduce the overall image size of this. I've seen some people do some quite cool things where they actually have it 
as a blurred image and an even smaller logo. So it blurs the planets out. So you can kind of see what's under there. And then just a smaller logo that they put on there. How would you blur faces? So once the system has exported your data or before you export your data and you move everything to your computer, you can do this before or after. With the Planix, if you're doing a single shot mode, you will get one image like this. So what you would do is you'd pop this into Photoshop. You'd use a blurring or a pixelation tool to do that. Save the image as it is, don't change anything else. And then that image is what will get exported to your iGuide. You can do this after the fact by going to here. So if we go to replace pano images here. We can select an image, scroll down. Yep, that's the image I want. Download the image, edit it, and re-upload here. So it's quite straightforward. Replace pano images here after the fact, and then edit the H1 and all the H2 images before you upload it. So two different methods. Uh, there is not a blur option yet. Um, if you think that would be helpful, feel free to post that on our um, suggestion forum. So if you go to forums.goiguide.com, I'm not logged in, so I can't see the operator one, but there should be, once you're logged in, a feature suggestion forum here. So I'll paste that in the chat so you have the link. That's a link to our forums. So there's a feature suggestion. Feel free to pop that in there. Um, all ideas are welcome. How long does it take to take a picture? So with the basic HDR mode, it takes probably three to three to four seconds to actually take a picture without being on the different HDR modes. So once it's, if it's on the basic external Rico or it's off for HDR, it takes about three to four seconds. With these ones on, it really depends on what level of EV you go for. Like a minus five plus two takes a little while to produce but still around about 10 to 15 seconds, um, including the processing. Whereas this one takes about, the basic one takes probably three seconds before you hear the bleeps, three to four seconds, and then a further five seconds to fully produce it. So about maybe between eight and 10 seconds to take a pay, to, to produce a scan. So it's pretty quick overall. I know that I did my house when we were first testing the planets. Um, so my house isn't very large, but it's 1400 square foot. And it took me with adequate panos, with line of sight and considering where the placement was, about seven and a half minutes to do the whole house. I think that was 35 scans, roughly. Bruno asks, how can I remove all references of the URL I use my own URL. That we the only way to do that would be a URL redirection. Um, so that your iguide.com is not customizable. You would have to use our redirection tool through the internet, so that you could you could maybe put your own URL on top of that. The only other thing you could do is embed it within your own website. So we do have an, an embedding tool. So if you wish to embed the iguide completely into your site come to the iGuide page here, choose which view. So click on edit here. And then on the left-hand side, you've got this embedding tool. So you can have it responsive, small, medium, large, or custom. Um, so if we look down here, this is a preview. So if we wanted it um, 800, so 1900. And then you'd copy this code if you know what you're doing with creating your websites and put it into your own website. That way you don't really see the iGuide URL, but you can still use the iGuide. That's your two options, is a URL redirect or, um, or embed it. Uh, from Desi, uh, I hope I pronounced that right, Desi. Uh, you say you must see the camera from the last scan. What if I forget a room or closet? Can I go back and shoot the closet? You absolutely can. It, what will happen is 
if you notice on site, so if you don't notice on site that you've missed something, but you notice in Stitch later on, say for example, oops, we missed that room down here. Like, oh, I know there's a room there that I missed. You can either have the eye guide published as is, and then have us add the missing space later when you collect it. So you'd start a new project, you'd get a scan exactly where I, I just moved the scan from. So you'd have a scan done outside the bathroom and then a scan done in the bathroom. So these two scans here, so 20 and 21 in this list, these green ones, you would take these and then you'd provide us with those scans. We can add that for you later on, a later date. Or what you can do is, it's a little trickier, but if we open the folder here, we can see that the data is set in a very specific order. So I go to my Q&A materials folder and we go into Planix data. So this would be the, this would be the, the title of the project. So the, typically the address, double click, double click on main floor. You can see each panel has its own folder. What you can then do is drag and drop the extra two panels into here and then right click on the project and re-import it. And it'll re-import all of the extra images for you. But when you re-import it, it will reset to so beware. So there's those two methods. Is contacting us and saying, hey, um, I, like we will contact you and say there's a missing space. However, the eye guide can be published as is, or we cannot publish the eye guide because this missing space is too crucial. You'll be given two options to, in the first instance, you can publish as is and add the missing space later. You can put the eye guide on hold, go get the missing spaces, provide it to us and we'll add it before it's even published or we can add it after it's published and send you an update. So there's, there's multiple ways of doing that. What I'd suggest is try not to miss a space in the first instance. <laughs> That's probably better than any of the above. What, so what is the difference between from survey to project? It's technically the same thing. So survey is what we refer to as our program. Um, so the app in quotation marks. Survey is our on-camera app that goes through and allows you to document a property. So that's what survey is. You are surveying the property, the app is called survey. Your project as, an, as, a, total, as, a, as a whole is the project file. So that project file I was showing you earlier. So this, this would be considered the project itself. This is your project file. So you'd copy the whole project from your USB drive to your computer. So from Bruno, uh, which HDR mode produces the best quality pictures? So that is entirely dependent on the situation. So um, if you are by a bright window, say for example here, so as you can see, the window is a little blown out, but not too much. It's really hard to find an example on this one. This was a very low light outside day. Um, if that's blown out, for example, what you'd want to do is change the EV value to maybe like a minus three plus three or a minus one plus one. So the minus one is reducing the brightness. The plus one is increasing the shadows, the darkness. So you're, when you're using a minus five plus two, you're really, really reducing the, the highlights um, when the, the whites when taking the image and you're upping the shadows. So the brights and the, that's basically what it does like you would do on a camera yourself to set the HDR bracketing. Um, so it, it's very much situation dependent. Typically within a house on a normal day where it's not too bright, it's an average day, you can probably get around using the external Rico mode the whole way through. Um, if you like a little bit of reduction and a little bit of increase, then I'd use the minus one plus one. These are going to take a little bit longer to produce, though, because they are being processed by, uh, by our system and not by the theta, because they're custom modes. 
So I, what I would do is, is take one shot with every mode and visually you'll see yourself, see what it's done so you can remember. Um, that's how I learn best personally is by doing and seeing what the results are. Oh, so that's what that did. That's what that did. And that's what that did. Um, so long as you remember the order which you took them in, you can review them later. Uh, Ryan, that's a good question. If we create two areas, main floor and casita, there may be some share, that may be sharing some of the outdoor panels. Are we able to move which outdoor panels are shown on which floor? Yeah, you can do that here. So if you've got two floors, so if you add a floor here, what you can do is like, oh, I want these panels here, this one, I want this one and this one. I want that on this new floor. But you can just drag and drop them. Typically though, if it's on the same level, you can keep it together. Um, if you have like a balcony or something, you want to keep the balcony, you want to keep the outdoor panels on the main floor so it doesn't look weird with the transition between the halos um, mainly. So you want to keep things on the same level, on the same level. Um, and if you're doing like a balcony shot um, and you've got a drone maybe, say this, Say for example, this was a balcony. You had a drone of the back garden, a drone image of the back garden at about the balcony level. That'd be a really cool image to pop just outside here, because you can add your own user panels, drone images to an eye guide. Um, how many scans can we do? As many as you like. So for a standard eye guide, um, you are charged on billable drafted area. So you're bill a billable square footage. You're not drafted on how many panels you took, uh, build on how many panels you took. You can take as many as you want. How do you position the outside scans? Great question. So this one doesn't have one, but say for example, we had um, some panels of the driveway. I'll be very quick here. So we had some panels of the, the path walking up. We'd have a panel down here, here and here. And as you're taking that data, because you still got the laser on, it's going to be hitting the exterior wall. So they'll start snapping to each other immediately. What you want to do is when you get to the door here, say this was a panel on the store step right here, open the doors at the front, open the front doors and take a scanner with the doors open and the doors closed. What that's going to do is it's going to give you that overlapping laser data. So when you come into the house, the interior of the house it's going to snap to the exterior panel you took, and it's going to be perfectly placed for walking through the house. And you could do that up the back the same as well. So this this back door here, you can see this doors. If you open this door, go outside, take a panel. There's going to be snappable data in here, and you just continue through, and it's auto placed, and it looks great. I love it when people take exterior panels. There is a way to show you what is being scanned before you shoot it. If you turn on always show LiDAR scan and save that, you go back to your project. Nope, your project. You can see this now, this is an emulator. Don't trust this. You can see that the green line is always showing. So you can see that in a live environment all the time right now. So you can turn that on so you can see what the scan data is picking up. Now, I don't think this live data auto aligns, so it might just be in the middle of the screen, but if you have the site to see, that's good. I can see that that's gonna overlap and you can, and you have the ability to see the jigsaw puzzle in a live environment. A lot of people do not, a lot of people do, then you can leave this on. It's gonna always be green so that it's less confusing. Right, well, thank you everybody for coming today. Uh, there's a few things I didn't get to mention. Um, but that's okay, it's not really relevant to this. Uh, this webinar, I think, is recorded, is recorded. If they deem it good enough, if they deem it worthy, they will put this up on the Masterclass site so that you can watch this again at a later date. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for your time. I hope you got some usefulness out of it. And, uh, and take care and have a great day. Bye for now.